I'll call this meeting of uh, the United States Election Assistance Commission uh, to order. Uh, we, we will start with uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, so if we'll all stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, let's start with a roll call, call vote. Uh, Commissioner Christy McCormick. Here. Vice Chairman Thomas Hicks. Here. And Chairman Masterson is here, so we have a quorum present. Uh, without objection, I, uh, I'll move to adopt the agenda and move forward. Okay. Uh, and uh, we'll start with Commissioner opening remarks. And so, uh, Commissioner McCormick, do you have anything to start the meeting? Uh, I don't. Let me get the microphone on. I, I don't have anything. Uh, special to say but to thank those who will be participating today uh, normally in August it's the you know middle of end of summer and not a lot going on but in elections there's always something going on so uh, I'm happy to hear the reports that we're going to hear today and uh, I want to thank you for putting the time in uh, in the middle of summer when you could be on vacation uh, being here to uh, to illuminate our uh, knowledge on uh, your area so thank you so much and uh, I look forward to hearing from you Thank you, Commissioner McCormick. Vice Chairman Hicks. Thank you, Chairman Masterson. Um, I want to thank you for calling this uh, meeting. Um, it's very important that we continually uh, let the American people know the vital role that we are playing in elections. Um, cybersecurity has been a very hot topic for 2017. I look forward to hearing the report on that. Um, I look forward to hearing from, our, uh, from Dr. Abbott about the uh, grants, and um, um, I'm looking forward to um, our Inspector General's report and, and our Executive Director's report as well. Um, the EAC has done a lot in the past uh, six months or so, and we have another six months of very hard work ahead of us. And so putting this uh, meeting together uh, when we are so uh, vitally busy um, I think is very important. Um, you know, with the, we had a call yesterday on the VBSG uh, 2.0. And we're looking forward to um, finalizing that uh, relatively soon. Um, I, so I want to thank you for your leadership on this and um, turn, turn, the gavel back, or turn the mic back over. Thank you, Vice Chairman Hicks, and I appreciate it. Uh, I would echo Commissioner McCormick's comments and Commissioner Hicks's comments. Thank you to all the presenters today. Uh, I think today's agenda is a good representation of the broad scope of work that the AAC does. It's not just focused on one area of election administration, but in fact applies to uh, a broad variety of topics. And so uh, we'll get into the meeting uh, and uh, move forward, and thank you to the, the presenters today. First, uh, as a matter of old business, uh, I'd like to move without objection uh, to approve the meeting minutes from uh, the January 1st meeting, uh, May 25th meeting, and December 15th. We had a backlog of minutes to approve. Uh, any objection to moving forward with approval of the minutes? Those are from 2016. Yeah, correct. 2016. No objection. No objection. All right, thank you. Um, I'd also like to remind uh, folks in the audience, uh, folks at the table, uh, please silence your cell phones uh, and also uh, welcome all of you here uh, to Silver Spring. Uh, and to those of you viewing on the webcast here today, uh, I think you'll find the meeting to be informative, uh, discuss, again, a broad variety of topics uh, for the EAC's coverage, uh, and I think important uh, areas from money to cybersecurity uh, to uh, updates on the uh, election and voting survey, which is uh, the largest survey of election data in the nation. So uh, with that, uh, we'll start with the new business section uh, and our executive director, Brian Newby, for an update. Mr. Newby. Thank you, Chairman Masterson, Vice Chair Hicks, and Commissioner McCormick. Yeah, it's been 21 months to the day, I realized, since I entered the office for the first time as the agency's second appointed executive director. And today's update from me, staff members, the IG, and guests will demonstrate the diverse activities underway at the agency and also harken back to themes from the very first executive director report I presented to you in January of 2016. At that meeting in early 2016, I reported on the departure of our chief operations officer. I announced that we would be undergoing a process to evaluate the best organizational structure within the agency and that we would not be backfilling that specific role of chief operations officer. Amidst an incredibly busy 2016 and with cybersecurity themes at the end of the year and into 2017, we've been working to right size our organization and to match talent needs with the changes in our focus. We've hired additional highly capable employees and our staff features a diverse blend of experience and backgrounds. 
You may recall that in your 2015 roles and responsibilities document passed upon your arrival to the agency, it included a requirement that the executive director work with the Office of Personnel Management to evaluate the organizational structure and all of our positions. That process is underway. A summary of the process and associated deliverables is attached to this report and in your packets. While we're at the front end of that process and the time to complete it is dependent on the time all of us can spend on it while we're working on other priorities, we all are approaching the process expeditiously, expecting to come out of the other side of this process with much more structure in our position, salary ranges, and levels. This is important to us and it, it aligns with OPM's wheelhouse. The goal is to ensure that EAC's human capital management practices and activities align with the agency's mission and goals. Currently, we're working to create clarity around the agency's mission and strategic goals. Agency leadership has been participating in strategic planning sessions to discuss the agency's mission and vision statements, and we've been working hard to develop a repeatable operating planning process as well. Our new communications director has developed a communications plan that we will be submitting to the Inspector General this fall to wrap up a long-term outstanding action item. Finally, in this area, I want to quickly applaud the work of our communications group, including all of those on our staff involved in our new website this year, and further, every single member of our staff. They've all contributed to a, at a high level of energy and pace that's been noticed by the election administrators we serve. I have a great deal of pride in what we've accomplished since I've come here in these 21 months, and we've accomplished it because of our great staff. We completed successful meetings for the Standards Board and Board of Advisors and are in the process of planning these meetings for 2018 in order to position version 2.0 of the Voluntary Voting System Guidelines for Commissioner approval in 2018. We expect the approval to be done in 2018, not to impact the 2018 elections, but to be prepared for elections in 2019, 2020, and beyond. Additionally, today you will hear of research and communications activities from our semi-annual election survey. We refer to it as our survey, but the survey is the community survey completed by election administrators in the country. The survey represents their data and we want to provide tools that help administrators communicate this information in ways that will further the election administration profession and the all overall voting experience. Thad Hall from Forest Marsh will speak to that today. In addition, on October 17, we will conduct a data symposium so scheduled in conjunction with the Election Center in October and we will be announcing more details on that soon. Finally, at the end of this report, you will hear from Mark Abbott, who leads our payment and grants effort. Mark is very active with payments follow-up from EAC's grants efforts, and he will provide an update on funding and state spending. Moving to the next item, the Cybersecurity Working Group, October also is well known throughout the country as Cybersecurity Month and provides a fitting transition to tell you the efforts underway to work with the Department of Homeland Security and members of the election administration community in helping DHS establish structure around its designation as elections as, as critical infrastructure. The EAC last month organized an election administrator cybersecurity working group with DHS to discuss sharing of cyber threat communications. And we will have a follow-up meeting with this working group in conjunction with events by the Election Center and the National Association of State Election Directors next week. The working group includes secretaries of state and local and state election administrators appointed by industry associations and our own advisory boards. One member of that cybersecurity working group, Noah Prates from Cook County, Illinois, is here and will speak to that effort from his perspective, as well as quickly speak on other cybersecurity issues. We are grateful for the engagement of Noah and his colleagues who met with us last month. Our primary goal is to understand expectations of how the EAC can best support election administrators as they prepare for the 2018 federal elections. Commissioner Hicks and I also late last month participated in a planning exercise with the state of New York related to the state's 2017 elections. We learned a lot with that and we came away with ideas that we can hope to emulate and deliver to the election community as part of our own cybersecurity initiatives. Uh, and there, while they can't really discuss too much of what occurred there, I think we just learned a lot of uh, valuable insight and a lot of exercises that we hope to emulate. Moving to the last item, October also marks the 15th year anniversary of the Help America Vote Act and its landmark provisions of a private and independent vote for people with disabilities. In conjunction with that milestone, we are announcing our second annual and expanded Clearinghouse Awards that we call the Clearies for outstanding achievement in election administration. Like last year, we are asking for submissions for best practices related to the recruiting, training, and retaining of election workers in addition, this year we are adding new categories, including best practices related to accessibility for voters with disabilities. 
This is important because this new award category will highlight best practices in polling place accessibility, vote by mail balloting, election worker training, machine accessibility, and ways to involve the disability community in the elections process. We have added a third category as well, outstanding innovations in elections. We have information on our website announced today to explain the launch of the 2017 awards and how to submit entries. A copy of the announcement is also included in your packet and I believe showing for those who are watching it streaming right now. And with that, I respectfully submit my report and stand for any questions. I'd open the floor for questions. Uh, Vice Chairman Hicks, any questions for uh, the Executive Director? Yeah, I just have a, f a couple and a couple of comments. The uh, meeting that you and I attended up in New York, um, I found very informative, uh, enlightening, and um, frightening. Um, and we can't divulge a lot of what went on with that meeting, but I would encourage uh, each and every state to possibly uh, hold a similar meeting with their election officials, emergency management folks, and um, IT people. Um, because uh, as we move forward with the 2018 and 2020 elections, um, you know, we've been told over and over again that um, the, the threat to elections is real and that um, it's continuing. So um, the more prepared we can be, the better off we will be. Um, so I would, you know, just lay that out there. Um, in terms of the um, the um, strategic planning and um, and the um, overall function of the the agency, um, I believe that you've done a great job in terms of right sizing the agency. Uh, but wanted to know uh, what sort of ideas you might have in terms of um, when you believe the strategic plan may be um, available for the commission to take a look at. Well, our target, if it's if it one that we've discussed internally, is to have something by the end of the calendar year. I don't know that that is feasible. That's a target because I think the most important thing is that we have complete buy-in on the strategies and procedures and policies. If we have something that we rush through, we may think we have a document, but it may not be something that we're really going to be able to execute. We don't have that buy-in. So, I mean, the target is the end of the year, but I, I wouldn't want to say that that is a target. Okay. Um, and lastly, uh, we've done a lot with cybersecurity, and one of the things that I was able to do was to work with one of the advocacy groups and in getting information on um, securing uh, elections and so that's on my uh, website on the EAC so I ask that folks take a look at that as well as the other materials that we have out there on uh, cybersecurity as well so with that that's my two questions and comments Commissioner McCormick uh, yes. thank you director Newby I appreciate your report and uh, also uh, thank you to the staff uh, those who are here and those who aren't uh, to all the the hard work you've been putting in to accomplish everything you've been accomplishing. Uh, could you just mention also the role of our interns who will be leaving us in September? Uh, if you could just give me a short brief on um, our interns at the moment. We've been blessed to have three uh, legal interns, law clerks, who have supported us over the summer. We've had two projects that we've asked them to work on. And one is updating the certification process, kind of the procedures, the documentation of certification state by state so that we have a com comprehensive guide to what each state is doing for certification. And then also we're looking at doing the same kind of state by state effort to update the information related to the National Voter Registration Act and how states are complying with that and their specific procedures. And these are two deliverables that they will be presenting actually to the full staff uh, we're hoping they, they will be leaving us uh, in early September, but they're hoping to present these deliverables to us a week from Tuesday at our staff meeting, actually. Okay. And a couple of them are, are, I think they're here. They may be around the corner. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you to those interns for all their hard work this summer, and uh, we look forward to the next batch of interns that we can uh, mold at the EAC in, in the elections community. Uh, also, we discussed a little bit about cybersecurity. Uh, could you just give us a little brief on the relationship of the EAC with the Department of Homeland Security and how that's going and uh, where you see that going? Sure. So and to some degree, this is the view that we've taken as a staff. And uh, the Department of Homeland Security certainly has 
identified elections as critical infrastructure, and we want to work with them. And we want to be as supportive as we can to the initiatives that they have. But in the end, and I, this is a personal thing, as elections for several years before I came here, these threats are not new. I mean, they may be, the, the players may be new, uh, they may be more sophisticated, but many of the threats are the same that uh, election administrators face and have been facing. And so we really what we want to do is create our own essentially cybersecurity initiative. We want to create our own support to election administrators. Not that we wouldn't anyway, but we want to make sure that we are answering what they think is important for the EAC to do and asking DHS to help us. So there's two different kind of initiatives going. We understand that they're going to focus on elections as critical infrastructure, but we think that we have a leadership role to take and be supportive of our election administrators, not just in cybersecurity, but really define what that means and how else we should be supporting them for continuity planning. Thank you. Uh, and then one last thing before I uh, pass it back over to Chairman Masterson. Uh, 2018 is staring us down. Uh, what kind of preparations uh, are you thinking about uh, at the EAC uh, t to get us up to speed for next year's elections? Well, so um, we have a few things going on. One is the the key thing for us really right now will be related to the voluntary voting system guidelines because in order to have those approved, we first must take those to our uh, advisory board, standards board, and board of advisors. So we are anticipating and hopeful that we will come to closure with those still this year so we can take those to the advisory boards at the end of January. So we're accelerating that meeting. But I think in general from our initiatives, I think we would be tone deaf if we weren't focused on the whole cybersecurity efforts and protecting the vote, securing vote, doing everything we can for election administrators. So as it, as silly as it sounds, we're focusing on the, the actual hashtag, the overall theme, and that's something that we kicked off with our staff just this week to start discussing what what is that theme of all our programs going to be. And we hope to have that uh, really to the, to the commissioners at, by the end of November so that we have a plan from January on for 18. Thank you for that update. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner McCormick. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Executive Director Newby. I just have a, a couple questions. First, I'd, I'd echo the praise for the staff. This has been uh, a busy year, uh, continues to be a busy year. It, it's been nonstop, and, and they've done incredible work uh, throughout the year, and I appreciate it. Uh, you touched a little bit on VVSG 2.0. I just want to make a comment that uh, September uh, 11th and 12th uh, is the meeting of our Technical Guidelines Development Committee here in Silver Spring. Uh, they'll be meeting uh, with the goal and the hope of finalizing their recommendations for VV VVSG 2.0. Uh, and you kind of touched on this in your answer to Commissioner McCormick, but walk through uh, briefly the steps that come from the time that the TGDC, hopefully, uh, approves the recommendations to the time that the commissioners are voting on uh, the next version of uh, the VVSG. So. The process would be that we will take it, we will, as soon as we can, we will actually distribute it. The VVSGs are indeed uh, voted on and passed in September. As soon as we can, we will get those to the advisory boards, but not to be any later than January, but as soon as we can, to provide a comment period and a, a time to discuss that with them at the meeting. And then there will be a period of time where they will be able to provide final comments as an advisory board. Then we will incorporate those. Uh, as we see, we, we will have some process to track them. Uh, we're discussing internally how we'll have some electronic process to track uh, comments. We will then submit them back out for public comments. And after a public comment period that we expect to be 90 days, then we will be uh, updating them one final time and then bringing them to the commission for approval. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question on the cybersecurity working group uh, and the meeting in Albany specifically. Can you give me, and I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Prates, the same question, so I'll, I'll give you a, a hint heading into uh, your testimony. What were your three quick takeaways from the, the meeting in Albany? What did you walk out of that meeting saying, okay, these are the three takeaways and these are the next steps? So, note to self, be a guest so I get a tip on yeah, the right. question Yeah, right, heads up. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think that, um, just trying try to think of, I mean, I'd make sure I say something that's really Meaningful here. Uh, I, th I mean, for us, I guess one of the takeaways was ha the industry in general has been asking DHS to to move on. You've, okay, you've declared a critical infrastructure. What's the next step? 
And I think what we saw when we went to Albany is they are accelerating. They're trying their best to get whatever they're going to do passed fast. And so they, they have a target of September to start creating the coordinating council and the charter. They're very focused on trying to hit there, while we know that election people have uh, elections every week, they're focused on having something ready for the 2018 elections, but they really are focused for that. Our view has been that for us, showtime is January 1. Even recognizing that uh, elections happen every week, whatever is going to be focused on, you know, for cybersecurity really needs to be done and prepared and started in the works for January 1, and that just reinforced it to me when we were there. Uh, Beyond that, I think there a takeaway that, again, was my own personal takeaway is I think we need to have further discussion about the way uh, cybersecurity threats will be communicated. I think there's a value in, in having a, a better tracking system so that election administrators aren't hit with them every day or every other week, and we have a way that we can go back and know what was communicated before, and some structure around that. And I think that's one of the things that we're going to talk about on Monday when we reconvene this cybersecurity working group. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'd, I'd reiterate uh, something that the Commissioner Hicks said and, and you said kind of uh, as a, a side comment, uh, but I know you meant it because uh, it's obvious, and that is uh, cybersecurity is the focus right now, right? Uh, we're in a new threat environment in that nation state actors have become a real presence, right, as we talk about this. And so working with election officials directly to talk about what that means, how that changes our risk profile, uh, and and how we work to mitigate and address those on an ongoing fashion, right, as we talk about persistent uh, threats uh, around it. And I think, uh, as you highlighted, that's going to be a focus for us every day moving forward uh, to address that. So I appreciate that. Um, I do not have any other questions. So thank you very much for your report and your time. Are there any follow-ups? I, I just want to say I'm uh, excited about the, the awards season coming up uh, and I encourage everybody out there to uh, get some nominations in the more the better we love to hear your ideas and uh, can't wait can't wait to, to read them and see who uh, comes up the winners this year thank you thank you mr. newbie thank I'd you. invite up uh, mr. Abbott uh, now for uh, testimony on uh, the current status of HAVA grants and HAVA money uh, or HAVA funding uh, and a, a new report, uh, expenditures report from EAC. So, uh, Mr. Abbott, when you're ready, uh, feel free to proceed. But uh, questions at the end. Under HAVA, $3.2 billion was invested between 2002 and 2011. Um, under titles 101, 102, and 251, also called requirements payments. This represents the largest and probably actually the only federal taxpayer investment in supporting the administration of federal elections at the state and local level. While the states have some funds remaining, and we'll talk a little bit about that, this report really tells the story of the successful con conclusion of that first investment that the federal government made in supporting federal elections at the local level. Um, some highlights of the report and some of the successes of, of our investment. First, our states and territories, 55 entities that received our funds, are in compliance with Title III of HAVA almost entirely. Um, over 90 percent of the funds have been audited by our Inspector General over the last 14 years, and less than 1 percent have had any challenges with how the money was spent. So the states, uh, under the administration of the EAC, has done a, a very good job of making sure that money was safeguarded and spent correctly. Cumulatively, this year, um, states have now surpassed the original amount of money that was given to them under those three titles. They are now either spending interest that accrued on that money or their own matching 5 percent um, of, of, of the funds, with the ex exception of a handful of states that have still have federal money available to them because their pace of spending was slower than other states. We can talk about that in a minute. A few highlights from the report. Overall, it was $3.248 billion that was um, awarded. That accrued $352 million in interest. Reported expenditures have been $3.29 million, leaving about $300 million still available to states. That's not spread across all of the states, though. 
13 states have expended all of their money and have no match money, no um, interest or federal money available to them to meet the requirements of HAVA going forward. 28 states have less than 10 percent. Only six states have more than 30 percent. So the amount of money is really, is really um, concentrated in a few places. Uh, a few highlights from all of that spending. Uh, the federal investment in the statewide voter registration systems was about $223 million. That's an estimate based on states rep reporting to us what they spent. Uh, that was about 7.5 percent of the total amount that we gave um, that was eligible for, for that expenditure. Uh, and voting systems and related equipment, about 65 percent of the money that we gave went directly to that equipment. Most of those purchases happened over a decade ago. Um, some states are still getting ready to buy new equipment because that's the schedule they're on or did it more recently, but by and large it was the early 2000s when the punch card machines were replaced and people upgraded their voting systems in general. Uh, a couple other highlights from the work we did. Uh, the, the commissioners voted in May to make it easier for states to dispose of their old equipment because of this issue of equipment aging out and needing to be replaced. So now states and localities are able to replace pieces or components of their equipment or trade that equipment in or, or, or trade it to another um, entity um, that might be in need of spare parts, for example. So we've been doing our part to make sure that we have some flexibility available to the states so that, that they can move that old equipment out, replace it with new equipment. So uh, that's just a very brief overview of the report uh, and, and the highlight. I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. <coughs> Commissioner McCormick, questions? Thank you, Mr. Abbott. Uh, I actually have just one question. Um, now that most of the federal funds are spent, uh, what will the states do to uh, stay in compliance with the Help America Vote Act? Uh, thank you for the question, Commissioner. I think it's a really uh, hard and important question and there's not an easy answer to it. Uh, the requirements of HAVA are not a one-time, we met them and we're done. They are ongoing. So as states are looking at large expenditures to replace equipment that is now aging out and maintaining all of the stuff that they, all of the requirements of Title III of HAVA going forward, they're going to be looking for financing for that. And um, it, whether that's federal financing through uh, another round of HAVA funding or state financing, we don't know the answer to that at this point. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you Thanks. for your report. Commissioner Hicks. Thank you, Dr. Abbott. Um, I really appreciate you coming in to uh, brief us today on this uh, very important issue. Um, I spent 11 years working on, the, in, on Capitol Hill and one of the um, accomplishments that we were able to do was to provide money for the Help America Vote Act. Um, and one of the legacies that I remember when I left was that there was still talk of not giving any more money. So President Bush and President Obama put uh, billions of dollars into the uh, Help America Vote Act. But as we move forward, um, the things that I've heard as a former Hill staffer is that um, there's still uh, a lot of concern that uh, some of the states still have money. Should we be concerned that these states still have money left in their coffers? So uh, there's about $300 million left in the coffers, which sounds like a lot of money. Uh, but in proportion to how much was given, it is not. Uh, it's less than 10 percent, and that constitutes the 5 percent match that states put in plus their interest. It's not spread evenly across all of the states. Um, but backing up for a second, when, when, when HAVA made this investment, uh, it, it, it came with a set of requirements and parameters for how the money was to be spent. But Congress specifically said how you spend that money and in the time frame you spend that money is up to you. The law gives this, the money does not expire like a traditional federal grant expires. It's, 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 it's open until spent. So states created state plans that had public input. They're implementing those state plans and they are on their own path to spending that money. Some states have chosen to hold money in reserve for voting systems coming up. Others needed to make large expenditures early. Some states were mostly in compliance with Title III uh, already, so they did not have to spend down as quickly as others. So there's a handful of states that constitute the majority of the $300 million, and they are on uh, their path, uh, which we've shown across the board to be fiduciary, responsible, and, and wise in every state. And I would say, so I would say there's nothing to worry about. 
Uh, we can we can look at their state plans and talk to them about what their expenditures are going to be in the next few years. But saying that we have money left so we should not make another investment really uh, puts the other 45 or so entities that, that have spent their money according to their plan at a disadvantage if we're talking about any, any additional resources to support Title III of HAVA. So um, just as a follow-up, um, I'm not great with math, but just looking through these figures here, it seems to me that more than 88 or 89 percent of the states have less than 10 percent to less between zero and 10 percent of their funds left over. That's correct. Okay. Yep. I'm done. Thank you, Commissioner Hicks. <clears throat> Just a couple uh, quick things. One is I want to thank you uh, in your report and, and comments for, for noting uh, the money spent uh, on development and maintenance of statewide voter registration databases. Uh, a lot of the attention in HAVA uh, focuses on the voting systems. I think fairly a big chunk of money was spent on that, but I think an, an underrated uh, portion of the conversation is the money that was given from HAVA to develop and, and build those statewide voter registration databases and the age of those now. And uh, I think moving forward for us as a commission, uh, one of our areas of focus is going to need to be uh, working with the states to help to understand uh, how to support and maintain uh, older voter reg systems, right, and upgrade those systems, which is a challenge uh, and certainly uh, something many states I know I, I struggled uh, we had to upgrade our system in Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that I appreciate you highlighting that. Two quick questions. Uh, the first is uh, you noted uh, commissioner, additional commissioner guidance on the replacement of vo aging voting systems and equipment or components. Uh, I know we uh, have worked on, talked with a lot of states about uh, additional guidance and help on disposal mm -hmm. uh, of systems. Uh, where are we on that? Have we issued additional guidance? And what, what else can we be doing to help states with the disposal of HAVA systems? Yes. So we have, we have uh, released additional guidance on disposal of systems. There's more work to be done in this area. Uh, most of the states are going to dispose of the equipments per state guidelines. Uh, those guidelines may or may not be up to speed on everything you should do with technology as you dispose of it, especially related to, as we've seen um, some reports recently related to material that might still be on hard drives or available that is personally identifiable information. So uh, what we will do is continue to push um, other people's best thinking on this out to our contacts at the state. Uh, we have made, we have told states that the money that they have avail left remaining can be used to help dispose of this equipment correctly. Um, and, and so I, I think that beyond that, there's not a lot we can do. Uh, I think the training and education and conversations around this are important. Uh, we've made it as flexible and easy as possible to dispose of pieces of your equipment um, going forward. Um, but it really is going to be up to the states and localities uh, uh, to, to ensure that they do that correctly. I'd, I'd like to echo that and encourage us to pursue uh, additional information and put out more information about proper disposal mm -hmm. of, of that. It's, it's not unique to the elections world. There's right. lots of information out there. I know the legal world uh, struggles a great deal with, with disposal of equipment and personally identifiable, identifiable information. And so uh, moving forward, uh, let's pursue uh, additional information on that. We'll work uh, on that, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, one last question, uh, and it's something that uh, I know the National Association of Counties recently highlighted, uh, as well as Secretary Wyman in Washington and, and some other secretaries at the NAS meeting, and that is a question around how much uh, from the original HAVA money uh, remains unappropriated. So h how much of the money hasn't yet been appropriated from Congress in, in that conversation? Yep. So it's a great question there, and it gets confusing because there's three kinds of money available, stuff that was never given by Congress, but the legislation authorized them to do it if they chose to, money that is sitting here at the EAC that has not been dispersed yet, and then money that's sitting with the states that they're, they're, they're spending per their plans. Here at the EAC, there's $3.4 million going to about six or seven states that are, are going to request it in the near future. Um, Georgia, for example, just requested theirs, $1.9 million, which and, is their And last quickly, that's, that's unallocated. That, that is allocated money right. that is here at the EAC. The unallocated money is about $400 million of the original $3 billion that was auth authorized under the HAVA legislation. It's up to the appropriators to s go up to that or even over that cap. They, they can do that if they want, um, to, to, to appropriate and then put that money in, a, in and pass it in legislation. Once that happens and it comes to us, we can 
we have a formula that we use to figure out who, who gets how much, and then that money is dispersed via a grant vehicle. Okay. Uh, thank you, and uh, I apologize. I uh, should have said Dr. Abbott, but it's the University of Pittsburgh. No I struggle with the Pittsburgh connection. <laughs> so uh, I, I appreciate uh, your time. I appreciate the report and the work you've put into it and your continued work, good work, uh, with the states uh, as we work to uh, work through the, the funding uh, questions and issues. So th thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I am now going to pull a classic Montessori move uh, and actually go to the Inspector General, uh, Pat Layfield, because it, it melds nicely from the conversation we just had with Dr. Abbott uh, regarding HAVA funding and auditing. Uh, and so I appreciate uh, just the flip-flop uh, with Mr. Prates. I hope you can hang tight for 10 more minutes here. Uh, so next up uh, is the uh, Election Assistance Commission uh, Inspector General. Uh, Pat Layfield. Uh, Ms. Layfield, since this is your first uh, testimony in front of us since becoming Inspector General, a brief introduction. Uh, as a financial professional with 40 years of experience uh, managing and performing audits in federal government and private sector, uh, prior to joining the AAC, Ms. Layfield worked in public accounting, where she speci specialized in conducting audits of federal agencies' uh, annual financial statements. Uh, she developed her firm's uh, financial statement audit practice, managed 40 financial statement audits in several federal, uh, seven federal agencies and served as in-house technical expert for accounting and auditing matters. Uh, I could say from uh, your time now here at the AC, all three of us have enjoyed working with you. I uh, appreciate the work you do. Uh, for those at home uh, that don't know, Ms. Layfield's in an office by herself here at the EAC down in the basement. And so we all have to come down and check on her from time to time uh, to make sure she's all right. And so, uh, Pat, thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony uh, today. And we look forward to getting an update on the Inspector General's efforts. Well, I'd like to thank the Commission for inviting me to testify today and uh, tell you a little bit about what's going on with the Office of Inspector General. As you're aware, we've had for a little over a year, we've had uh, audits of states going on, and we are now issuing those reports. Um, we issued the S South Dakota audit on uh, July 31st. Uh, Vermont went out August 2nd, and Puerto Rico final report went out August 7th. Uh, we have just received Mississippi's response, and so I expect that that one will go out final in an, within the next week or two. Um, and we have issued draft reports to New Hampshire and Maryland, and they are currently preparing their responses. Um, so those are pretty much the last six states that uh, to be done, for now anyway. Um, I also started an audit of EAC's decision-making policies. Um, I've contracted with the U.S. Postal Service Office of Inspector General, um, OIG, yeah, well, OIG. Uh, the objective of the audit was to determine whether the decision-making controls at EAC were properly designed, placed in operation, and operating effectively to provide reasonable assurance that key EAC decision-making policies would meet their objectives. Um, we do have findings in that report. The findings are similar to those that um, have been around since my predecessor, Curtis Kreider, did an audit in 2008. The, our recommendations worked out to be pretty much similar. Um, those recommendations are to develop and document a uh, strategic plan enhance records management, and then establish a project plan to get all that done. Um, and as you know, EAC has already responded to that, and everything's in process. I mean, you have, you spoke earlier, uh, Mr. Newby, about uh, the progress that's being made on the strategic plan, um, and plans to enhance records management are uh, moving along and you already have a timeline to get that done. Um, I think it's this calendar year, some maybe this fiscal year yet, or I'm not sure. Uh, That's right. I mean, okay. <laughs> in essence, yes, yeah, some, some are, uh, a couple of them are this fiscal year and a couple are this calendar year. The U.S. Postal Service OIG has provided to me a final report 
and I am currently in the process of doing my final checks and balances of my working papers and composing a transmittal letter for that report, which I hope to have to the commissioners this week. Um, in addition to those seven audits, I have in progress the FISMA evaluation and the financial statement audit for 2017. The financial statement audit technically began with an entrance conference in March, March 29th. Uh, the activity ebbs and flows on that. I imagine our CFO is probably more deeply involved in it right now than I am because uh, I tend to get involved at the end when I'm looking at what the contractor does. And the FISMA evaluation, uh, which FISMA stands for the Federal Information Systems Modernization Act of 2014. Um, and every year, the IGs have to do an evaluation of the agency's compliance with that. And we began that on June 9th. Uh, we are again using Clifton Larson Allen for that and using Brown and Company for our financial statement audit. Uh, next year will be a new uh, procurement for both of those. Finally, I'm getting ready to start a new audit that I hope to announce again in the next couple of weeks on Data Act reporting. The Data Act, in part, requires federal agencies to report financial and award data in accordance with established government-wide financial data standards. Once submitted, that data, those data are displayed on usaspending.gov for taxpayers and policymakers. The Act also requires IGs of each federal agency to review a statistically valid sample of the spending data submitted by the federal agency for the second quarter of 2017. It's that submission, that second quarter submission. And then I have to submit to Congress and make publicly available a report assessing the completeness, timeliness, quality, and accuracy of the data sampled and the implementation and use of the government-wide financial data standards by the agency. Um, the IG reports um, are due to Congress on November the 8th, 2017, and biennially after that. So we'll have to do it again in 2019. I don't know the scope of the 2019. I, this time is the first time. Actually, Congress required the IGs to submit a report in November of 2016, but did not require the agencies to submit data until May of 2017. So, SIGI, the Council of the Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency, wrote a letter to Congress informing them that the IGs would do the audit in November of 17 instead. Um, this SIGI guidance requires that we look at 300 and something, 386 transactions minimum. I believe EAC has about a dozen transactions. <laughs> I will be looking at 100%. <laughs> um, it's not payroll transactions. It's only contracts and grants, basically, and payments on those. So that's why EAC right now doesn't have a lot to report for the second quarter. We were under a CR, so a uh, continuing resolution. So there's just not a lot of activity during that quarter that I have to report on. Um, I have interagency agreements in place with other IGs. Um, I have, in order to meet government auditing standards, my work must be reviewed if I do an audit, and I can't review my own work. So the interagency agreement I have with the IG at the Federal Maritime Commission, we're, he's in the same position. So I'm gonna review his, he's gonna review mine, and we're both gonna issue the reports internally. And then I have a second uh, contract, interagency agreement with another IG who's going to do what we call referencing, and that's tracing all the facts in the uh, final draft report to 
the supporting documentation I have to make sure I've got all the facts and figures right before the report goes out. So I have those agreements in place. And I just need to get the audit started and get it done. Uh, so I expect to conduct an entrance conference this month and complete the audit by the November due date. Uh, finally, another thing I wanted to make the Commission aware of and the people who are here today, uh, there's a new website uh, called oversight.gov. It's sponsored by the Council of the Inspectors General on Economy and Efficiency, again, affectionately known as SIGI. They've launched this new website, which is currently in beta test mode. It is up and running. You can see it on the Internet, but it's not fully populated yet. Eventually, all of the OIG reports from all 73 Federal Inspectors General are to be available through that site, which is designed specifically to be a one-stop shop for IG reports government-wide for the press, the public, anybody, any interested party who wants to go see what, what's out there. The site allows users to see audits by state, by agency, by date, by OIG, by report number, and to search using keywords. SIGI is currently asking the IGs to upload semi-annual reports going back to October 1st, 2012, and all other reports, which would include audits, inspections, evaluations, investigations, and management challenges, going back to October 1st, 2015. That is supposed to be done in time for the scheduled launch on October 1st, 2017, which is when it's supposed to go live in production. Now, I'm not sure whether SIGI in, intends for us then to go back and old, load older reports or not, um, but I have until October 1st. I've got one semi-annual out there <laughs> so far. <laughs> uh, in between all these audits, I'll, I'll, get, it, I'll get it loaded out there. So I did want to, though, one of the reasons I wanted to use this forum to uh, talk about this website is that um, because I have to go back, uh, you know, states that whose audits were done a couple of years ago might fall under those deadlines or those uh, guidelines of reports to be loaded. So I did want to take this opportunity to make it publicly known that those reports will be going out there in a place that people are not used to seeing them. And with that, that's what activities I've been up to, and I'm open to questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Layfield, uh, for your work. Uh, I don't think people appreciate how hard it is to be an auditor by <laughs> oneself. Uh, and so I appreciate the work you do in your shop uh, and, uh, you know, being a small agency and the challenges that that comes. I have no uh, specific questions. I appreciate the information, uh, and we'll... Uh, turn it over to either one of the other commissioners for questions. Sure, I'll go. Thank you so much, uh, Inspector General Layfield. Uh, you mentioned the audits of the states that are going on. Uh, how many states are left to do any kind of audit on their HAVA grant money? Right now, I only know of three jurisdictions, shall we say, that have not been audited at all. Okay. And that was Alaska, uh, Guam, and See, Mom, here I'm uh, and blind. <laughs> I know. I in the Pacific, the, the American other, Samoa. That's it. Okay. Yeah, the American Samoa. Um, yeah, those three have not been done at all. Are you on to second in audits with any of these states? Yeah, well, Maryland is Maryland a second Maryland is audit. Maryland is a second audit. And um, my predecessor, Curtis Kreider, had done audits of some states more than once. Yeah. Do you expect to? Uh, get to all the states uh, soon or at least within the near future so that every st every state or territory has at least been audited once for the HAVA money they've received? Um, I learned my lesson last year. I mean, part of the reason that these audits have been going on for an entire year is that I learned about um, trying to do an audit during the election year. <laughs> so <laughs> I do not plan to do any audits between in states between now and 2018. Okay. And what's beyond that, I mean, we are getting to the point, as um, Dr. Abbott mentioned, the last 
money that went out was, what, 2011, I think? Um, and one of the things that we noticed in these last audits was states are reaching their retention limits and discarding the records that mm. the auditors need to look for. So there's, there's a bit of a balancing there. Um, how far come, should we go back? And I mean, even the last money, that's six years old now. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's got a five-year retention, the records might not be there. So I really okay. have to think about it. Okay. Thank you so much for all your hard work. Appreciate it. Inspector Layfield, I want to thank you again for all your hard work, as Commissioner McCormick and Masterson have said. Um, I don't have any real specific questions uh, other than um, I don't believe you spoke of your new role it, it, with Siggy as well. Um, so if you wanted to t elaborate a little bit on that um, for the audience, I would. Yeah. Um, thank um, you. Siggy, the chairman of Siggy's audit committee, has appointed me to be a member of the Accounting and Auditing Policy Committee of the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board. For those of you who don't know, that's FASAB. For those of you who don't know what that is, <laughs> it is to the federal government what the AICPA is to commercial entities. It establishes generally accepted accounting principles for the federal government. So. Thank you. Congratulations on your, your leadership position, and uh, I hear they have wild happy hours, so <laughs> con congrats. You'd be surprised how accountants <laughs> uh, Thank you for your time uh, and, and your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Prates, we'll invite you up now, uh, and I'll do the introduction while you get settled in there. Uh, next up on the agenda uh, is Mr. Noah Prates. He is the election director for Cook County, Illinois. Uh, in his role, he's responsible for the overall management of elections in Cook County, Illinois, one of the largest jurisdictions in the country. It, each year, he and his team serve uh, 1.5 million voters, facilitate democracy for thousands of candidates, and train and support thousands more volunteers who help to administer democracy. He's a board member of the International Association of Government Officials, or IGO. He's also active in the Election Center uh, and Illinois Association of County Clerks and Recorders, uh, including being on the Election Center uh, Cybersecurity Task Force. Uh, in his free time, and I love this, uh, Noah loves to run for hours on trails and roads. He's uh, an ultra marathoner, uh, which I think has a metaphor to elections, uh, certainly uh, the, the long haul, uh, and loves uh, his home county of Cook County. And I would also wish his wife, Megan, a happy birthday. Uh -huh. Uh, and hopefully that, that takes a little bit of the sting away at home from missing your birthday yeah, while yeah. you're here testifying. Um, if we make the flight. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to make I'll the flight. I'll be all right. I no, promise no. you'll make We're the flight. Uh, and so, uh, Mr. Prates, thank you for being here uh, and for uh, speaking specifically about not only Cook County's efforts, but sort of a, a local election official's perspective on uh, the current cybersecurity environment, uh, risk environment, uh, and moving forward towards 2018, how the EAC uh, can help support uh, and better secure elections working with you. Okay, great. Well, let me thank all of you, uh, Chairman and Commissioners. Appreciate all the work that you did in the run-up to 2016, what you're doing now, and what you'll uh, continue to do for us in this space over the next few years. Uh, a note, I'm one of thousands of election officials, all probably with uh, different opinions. Um, you know, I had a busy summer, traveled to a lot of places. I'll just l lay out some thoughts and answer questions at the end. Uh, first, Las Vegas, right? Each year, uh, thousands of good guy hackers descend on the city um, to learn tech and hack tech. And last month at DEF CON, um, some cyber professionals and, and young folks took a shot at hacking uh, election equipment. Not surprisingly, they successfully and quickly defeated the defenses of some equipment that's uh, been in use in this country over the past 10 years. Um, from, my under, from what I understand, one professor was able to use a wireless access point to gain control of a CPU of a voting machine used for years, but was a voting machine that was decertified years ago. Another plugged in a keyboard to a USB port and was able to get access to the admin screen, giving her some powers, though not unlimited powers. Um, but in another room, uh, the organizers packed eight solid hours of pretty high quality lecture on the state of elections tech and security in elections. And this was a room I was 
in with incidentally dozens of other election officials and vendors from around the country, folks taking this pretty seriously. Now the goal of the organizers was uh, to erase the word unhackable from the vocabulary of our country's elections officials. I don't think it's in our vocabulary, but that was a stated goal. And they also wanted to offer the opportunity for election officials to come and get some defense training to raise some awareness and some general understanding. I did take this as generally a good faith effort. I'll offer a couple uh, criticisms just on behalf of colleagues around the, the countries. They had access unfettered to, to equipment. In the real world, that's not um, a level of access that anybody has. We take physical security pretty seriously. Though, an, an admission, um, SEALs are defeatable. Um, they're not always utilized to their fullest degree by, uh, by election judges. So, so while we employ physical security, it, it's not the entire answer. Um, now, the equipment that was attacked generally was old, right? And at the speed of technology, there's a lot of new, good equipment coming on the front. There are some really exciting projects going on in this country that promises to bring even better equipment uh, to the fore. But, but we're not there yet, and some of this stuff is in use, and one of the main reasons is um, we're not funding our election infrastructure the way we need to in this country, right? If we had more access to um, dollars, we could bring better technology to the forefront. Um, another criticism is that uh, it was focused, uh, most of this country uses paper ballots, right? Or they have a voter verifiable paper trail if they use an electronic only ballot. And a lot of the critique was aimed uh, squarely at um, the uh, machines that don't have either of those, okay? But despite these critiques, I, I must grant the general point um, that you know, technology is breachable and hackable, and, and there are ways to, to limit that and limit the damage that's done. Um, you know, the bottom line is the vulnerability assessment done at DEF CON was similar to one that was done over the last 15 years, with no mainstream or validated claims of breach affecting anything. Um, my concern is that this time lapse has led election officials to have a false sense of security. The new threat vectors of nation state actors probing our networks was, was not demonstrated here. Uh, the group, though, in fairness, did uh, seek to create a simulated network environment that would look uh, like ours, and we actually um, consulted with them on this uh, so that we pairing up with security professionals that are able to um, assess and help us defend against uh, real risks. The strongest pitch at DEF CON was made by Skype from former U.S. Ambassador to NATO, General Douglas Lute. Convincingly, he wrapped in new geopolitical forces and threat vectors and argued that the world has changed significantly for us. Today, we have nation state actors with rooms full of people probing our election subsystems, not pro probing DOD, probing counties and cities all over this country. Uh, he made a convincing argument that the probability of breach has increased dramatically, that the consequences are severe, uh, that the risk equation for all of us has been reset. And so everything we know about the world through this new prism um, kind of clarifies the predicament we're in. Um, the bottom line for me is that from what we watched there, uh, but more from what we already know about the changing world and about technology, um, is that the, the broad point sh should be conceded, and I think is broadly conceded, that everything is hackable, everything's breachable at some level. Where does this leave us exactly if nothing can be made, made 100% uh, untouchable? All right, so I'll, I'll focus next on um, some other journeys this summer. Uh, I think our eyes are wide open, that we all focus on, um, you know, even with differing degrees of dread, uh, that if we agree that attacks are possible, um, both net retail hacking, like DEF CON or nation state hacking, um, now we need to do three big things. One is ensure resiliency, two, increase defenses, and three, increase our verification. Put another way, defend, detect, recover. For me, chief among all is resiliency or recovery. Let me put my Cook County hat on for a moment, but in suburban Cook County, we have a paper, piece of paper for each voter, either optical scan ballots or voter verified uh, paper audit trails from touchscreens. 
if our so God forbid our software is hacked, we could reconst reconstitute the vote totals. It won't be pretty. I probably won't still have a job, but it's possible. That's resiliency. And remember, that's true in most of the country. Nearly 80% of voters use machinery with paper trails or votes on a piece of paper with a pen. Now, I have friends and colleagues that run elections in places without paper. And I, I personally cannot imagine the burden they must feel defending against nation states without an ultimate fallback position of hand counting the paper ballots if the unthinkable happens. But I'll also say, knowing them, that uh, they'll bring the necessary computer science expertise to bring their defensive posture up to where it needs to be. Also in Illinois, from a resiliency perspective, we have election day registration. If our voter registration system is again targeted, breached, and somehow uh, records are manipulated, we can conduct an election without disenfranchising any voters in Illinois. Okay, there are policy arguments for or against, but from a security and resiliency perspective, election day registration decreases the burden we face for perfect defense. I'm thankful that we've made the policy decisions to risk our down to, to limit our downside risk uh, from that perspective. Now, a close second priority to resiliency is verification, right, or detection. It doesn't do a whole lot of good to be resilient if we don't know that we've been targeted or breached, if we aren't auditing whether our machines are telling the votes as cast. Most states do really great uh, audits, but there are better things uh, out there. Increasingly, people are exploring the idea of risk-limiting audits. States are adopting them. We're going to be introducing uh, legislation in Illinois. It's a way of using a fraction of ballots in a hand-counted recount to raise the statistical probability that an election was counted properly. Now, it seems to me in any uh, recount a situation, we ought to all capitalize on the opportunity to prove to people that our computers tested, certified, and used are counting things accurately. And it's pretty easy to do if you let folks count the races they're interested in by hand. Now, also in Illinois, wearing my hat here from a verification perspective, um, in Cook County, we use something really cool called uh, applied forensics. Okay. We take a hash type digital forensic capture of the certified re reference copy um, of our software, of our tally system, a so-called clean copy, and we compare digital snapshots of all our servers, nodes, and a s significant sample of our election equipment to the clean copy. We do this three times for each election, before we prepare our equipment, after we prepare it, before we ship it out, and then after it returns from the polling place. So there are absolutely ways to say with high confidence that nothing untoward happened in the election. I think applied forensics can really help, certainly in places uh, without paper where verification in some ways is a little more difficult. But then finally, and what we focus on a lot in the cyberspace, is defense. If it's hackable, we can make it really, really hard with good defenses. Okay? But this is a slog. It's a problem area, I think, uh, and a place where I look forward for, for your guys' leadership. We have thousands of election managers in this country with staff counts ranging from one to 400. The capacity differences are staggering. If the critical infrastructure designation means anything, if we were to believe the federal government sources that tell us to prepare for the Russians and other advanced persistent threats, but then the bottom line, in my opinion, is we, we could probably use some help here focusing on our defenses. Now, DHS and other federal officials offer some help, state officials other help, but the ones on the front lines are counties and cities around the country. Now, as part of the cybersecurity group at the Election Center, we made a really robust checklist to raise the ecosystem a bit of our membership in uh, all the counties and cities nationwide. And lists are great, but there really is no substitute for on the ground expertise. We've gotten pretty good at our physical defenses, at locks and seals and cameras, but in this new threat space, in the cyberspace, um, we're going to need a little bit of, a little bit more assistance. Remember the single staff election administrator. You think they can hire a vendor, they can afford to hire a vendor representative to be on site for the 12 critical weeks around each election. And that's where we'll find the advanced persistence threats and the Russians and others probing networks and people for mistakes. 
Now, in places way less cool than Vegas, election professionals, some of you among them, have been getting together, getting down to the real business of increasing our security awareness, our resiliency, and our defensive posture. There was a meeting in Albany last week. The Department of Homeland Security's recent critical infrastructure demanded that election officials from all government uh, levels are required to build a network and a system for sharing information. Now, amongst those there, we shared a significant recognition that the risk is not hypothetical and the threat vector is new, that it's significant and that it's growing. Now, there was some disagreement, certainly, as to the level of risk, who bears the responsibility for action, roles to be played by different actors. But if that had all been settled, we wouldn't have needed to meet in Albany. Voluntary efforts are underway throughout the industry to organize a community from the top to the bottom, to share information and offer defensive resources, to share best practices, to evolve quickly on resiliency and verifiability. There are cyber security cybersecurity committees in the Election Center, in IGO, in NASAD, and NAS. This summer in Florida and California, in Indianapolis, Washington, D.C., bodies of election officials were getting busy working on the future, trying to recognize and defend against the new threats, trying to become agile actors in a changing world. In Florida, Chairman, you admonished us to be aware of the new norm of nation state actors acting against us. We took it seriously. In state, uh, meetings of election officials are all addressing this. And we're coming to terms with the new normal. It's not pretty. It's not easy. But even for the skeptics, many are willing to consider new facts and procedures, if nothing more than a relatively cost-effective insurance instrument. Sometimes it's not all that cost-effective. It may mean a new voting system. But it could mean a new audit procedure, a new network monitoring device, a password change regimen that can protect themselves and indeed all of us. So a final thought. Security is an idea. It's a process. It's not a place. To be secure is not to be unhackable. That's impossible, probably. To be secure is to accurately assess all threats and weaknesses, to take reasonable measures to limit the risks, and to be able to get up when knocked down. Security is resilience. For my fellow election officials, and, and for white hat hackers and cybersecurity professionals, we should agree to a more nuanced framing. It's not binary. To ignore the nuance, to ignore that security is a matter of degrees, is simply to chop this problem up as one that we can't solve. But if we accept the premise that everything is at some level breachable, and we do what we can to defend and get back up when our defenses fail, we'll be secure. For election officials in particular, we'll need to usher in and accept a leadership culture that's a bit less protective and parochial. Chairman Masterson, you penned a piece recently about the EAC website breach. I think that's applauded, it should be applauded. Uh, the threats are fast, breaches are more common. The hope of staying ahead is being honest and sharing information up and down levels of government and across. I think people will reward that. Our industry should probably find a way to embrace the good guy hackers. We can't pay for the type of testing they offer, whether it's voluntary exercises by the private sector, like you may have seen at DEF CON, or paying bounties to hackers that report bugs like happens in other industries. Uh, we can create a norm in our industry that shows how seriously we take this threat. Nobody holds the sanctity and security of elections more dear than election officials. I think we can prove that professionalism and maturity if we accept the new threats that we can't change and change the processes we can. So to defend, to detect, to recover, that's now our job. Thank you. If you have any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony, uh, your candor, <coughs> and the recognition of the challenges we face moving forward and, and quickly, right? You've already started preparing. Yep. Uh, for next year. So uh, with that, I'll uh, open up questions. Commissioner McCormick, uh, if you have questions for uh, Mr. Prates. Sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Prates, for your testimony. I appreciate it. And I agree with uh, Chairman Masterson. Really appreciate the candor that you're uh, witnessing, your witnesses for us. Um, from a local election director viewpoint, uh, what are some of the top concerns you have with regard to the risk uh, equation reset? 
Um, so, so if we're to accept that there's this major new threat actor, um, then uh, it's not a retail, it's not a guy getting into your um, where, warehouse, right, or into the polling place the night before the election. These are people sitting in rooms from ac across the across the world. And it's, uh, I mean, I have a hard time myself even comprehending what that means, uh, the amount of resources there, the amount of time that it takes. I mean, you know, even if you're completely segmented off uh, your, your, all your network environments, there's still the possibility of uh, compromising individuals that the attacks on uh, election officials personally, right, through uh, hacking their own emails. I mean, just the entire world um, has shifted. And so what we need to do is think about a, a very different worst case scenario. Um, and so that's, that's the main thing for me is when, when it happens, how do we get back up? How do we get back up? How are we resilient? How do we recover? So more robust vulnerability assessments are probably So vulnerability assessments are great. Um, I, I think, you know, we all come from a very different profile. As I laid out, Illinois has got one that's got a lot of recovery or resiliency built into the system, but not every state's like that. And so what I think the challenge is for each election administrator is to run through kind of a decision-making or assessment matrix, uh, looking at their own, their own policy, uh, policy decisions made in their state and then their own um, management decisions made in their office to see exactly where they stand. How much do they have to put into defense versus verification um, and recovery? And my sense is that the risk profiles are very different across this country. Mm -hmm. Slotting ourselves appropriately and then having a, um, a framework for making decisions out of that is going to be very important. So the EAC could help by establishing some sort of framework or resources to start doing those kinds of. I think that would be great. Uh, mm -hmm. find, let us each slot ourselves, given the decisions that you know our legislatures have made, or our predecessors, or even we've made ourselves, um, and then through that risk assessment, a, a bit of a path forward, right? Yeah, and of course we're especially concerned about uh, those very tiny election offices, like you say, with the, with the single person in them who doesn't have any help sure. uh, or resources available. So. And we've always thought, why would anybody attack them? Nothing can be outcome determinative. But as we've uh, learned over the last six months to a year, that mischief making is uh, bad enough, right? And if you can make mischief in a, in a tiny little place, then that may accomplish the ultimate goal of some of these actors. Or a few tiny little places, right? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, you mentioned uh, the applied forensics that you use in Cook County. Yeah. Um, do you have a sense of how pervasive that is among election offices in the country? I think we're the only ones. Really? Interesting. That's right. Now, um, I, well, these are the kind of things that come with economies of scale. Mm -hmm. um, being the only one. It's, it's, it's not a cheap endeavor. It's one that offers yeah. a heck of a lot of security, we think. Um, and so one we've been willing to invest in, but I can certainly see uh, in the past why, um, with, with threats being hypothetical and having not materialized, uh, election officials would choose not to make that investment. But today, I think, with a very new threat vector, um, that it's an investment that's worth considering. And if enough were in, uh, the system, I think you'd find competitors that would come in and offer similar services, drive down costs, and it'd be something that would r raise our profile significantly. Well, thank you. Thank you for your leadership uh, in this effort. It's a very serious effort. We're, we're all taking it, the entire election community is taking it very seriously, and uh, uh, we need folks to step up and take leadership roles in, in how to uh, create a more secure election environment, and uh, we appreciate that, and I appreciate your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Pretz. Um, I want to thank you for your leadership on this and uh, for attending that conference. Um, one of the questions that I have is that um, with these folks who were um, manipulating these older machines, did they also go into other aspects in the election uh, field in terms of um, the voter registration uh, issues or the election night reporting issues as well? Because uh, one of the things I found out is that, well, I knew, but um, I had the opportunity to attend a conference in, in The Hague. And this is not a unique 
problem with the United States. There are countries from around the world who are facing the same sort of issues. And so I um, wanted to know, um, that's, that's my first question of, did they look at more than just machines in that, in that realm? So um, to my knowledge, there were a few poll books, um, the older variety. Um, I think one of them was accessed uh, pretty simply. Um, and again, each of these little pieces of equipment or subsystems have different uh, consequences for uh, election officials. And, um, you know, there's a balance between security and access. You can make your job a lot harder, not, not get any of the benefits of modern technology and have a different security profile, but you're also, um, you know, you're not also not managing a, a modern elections uh, infrastructure. Uh, so yes, there was um, there were some old models of poll books, but certainly uh, I think among the organizers, a recognition that um, there's a new threat vector, and that should be one that uh, needs to be explored uh, over the years. And, and by and large, I took certainly the organizers and many of the folks there as being fairly good faith. I've got a, a different sense of how I might handle things tactically, but that's not sort of my my purview. This is a space that. They're in. I think they share the goals broadly that uh, we all do. Um, I think there's a great opportunity right now with a new threat to stop talking about the wars of the last 15 years and focus on the wars of the next 15. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and That's I think they segue. can be partners. Yeah. That's a great segue to my next question because I view it as we're no longer living in the world of the big bad wolf blowing the house down. It's the big bad you know, grizzly bear that's looking to knock down the house. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a brick wall is going to stop that um, moving forward. So I think that one of the, the questions that I have is that um, when you spoke of, you know, eight, 75 to 80 percent of the country now uses paper um, to ensure that um, those who have disabilities can still vote um, independently and privately, as Hava says. And I know that um, Illinois does this, but uh, can you elaborate a little bit on um, how uh, we can move forward with security and ensure that we um, do not leave those who have disabilities behind? Sure. Um, so, so currently in Illinois, and uh, in full disclosure, we're in the middle of a, um, a, a procurement effort in suburban Cook County. And what we asked for was we love computers for all the interface and, and the, the data size advantages and for the ability to serve um, our communities of different sort of uh, different able abilities. Um, so y you combine the best of the both worlds, which is using the kind of touch screen or computer based interface um, and uh, memory capacity. Um, but then you print out an actual tactile ballot that, that they review and they either take it over and put it in the ballot box. So you end up on a security footing similar to um, just voting on paper. Um, but with a uh, disability access footing uh, similar to the one we've had since HAVA and is, in fact, our mandate. Okay. That's, that's what, what the, uh, the questions I have. Um, when do you, I figure that they are going to have a report that they're putting out? Did they elaborate a little bit more on when that report will be? My sense um, is it's ongoing. There's some stuff, I think, published already, um, an ongoing r report. But in terms of the, the organizers, I think there was a hope in the next couple of weeks that it would be out and available for all of us to, to review. Great. And I thank you for um, attending and sure. um, wish your wife a happy yeah. birthday. As Appreciate well. it very much. Uh, I should have mentioned it's your wife's uh, 21st birthday. That's so right. That's why you need to get back. <laughs> sure um, love that. A uh, couple, <laughs> couple quick questions. Uh, the first is the, the one I already previewed for you, which is your takeaways from the meeting uh, in Albany uh, with the Department of Homeland Security and the EAC. What, what were uh, kind of your uh, conclusions and, and next steps forward based on what you heard there? Sure. Uh, well, one of my big takeaways was that um, local election officials probably need to step up their um, kind of vocal participation in the discussion around election security. Uh, state officials have, um, have, a, have a major role to play and are vocal and are at the table a lot. Um, but I think local election officials responsible for the care and upkeep of every piece of equipment and every voter record and every polling place and for counting uh, every vote uh, need to be sure that as we talk about the risk assessment and our feelings of vulnerability that we're able to be 
at the table because I think it's a very it's a different profile than um, some of the other the other partners. So I'm glad, uh, very glad that the organizations that were chosen uh, do represent local officials, um, and they and they had people there. Um, I'm a bit concerned with the with the pace um, of. Uh, of help, we were able to get uh, cyber hygiene uh, pretty quickly from DHS uh, last year, and that that was great to do. Um, though, for any services that go beyond that, the the wait time was fairly significant, and so it it makes me realize that um, you know we cannot rely on we're not we can't wait for Superman, right? A lot of this stuff we have to take onto our own. We need to find local partners that are willing to come in and. And help us out. It's not going to be necessarily the, the federal government that's going to provide a um, get us on a firm security footing. Though they've certainly got a role. Um, and then and then third is that there is still some in-state information sharing. Uh, a lot of frustration was exhibited towards DHS for not sharing information on the 21, I guess, or whatever the number is right now. States that had uh, a, a different breach levels going into last November. Um, and they said they've notified the owners, which in often cases are the state CISO. And so, you know, it's not just federal government holding information, it's information sharing within the state between different office holders. And so what that just reminds me of is that it's a, our parochial nature, uh, our s siloed uh, kind of information holding for, for a variety of reasons. But I don't think we can afford to do that anymore. So I hope that we get to a place where we're able to um, open the books, and I applaud you guys for doing that with your with your article recently. Uh, you mentioned the the kind of stopping and fighting the battles for the last fifteen years and, and looking forward, uh, yeah. and, and recognizing in in this new threat environment uh, the need uh, for a coordinated effort, right? Sure. Uh, and having gone to DEFCON and. and uh, EAC had a staffer there too. Can you speak to the opportunity that may exist for free resources, whether through white hat hackers at DEF CON or other areas uh, where election officials who are resource limited and in some places severely resource limited sure. may be able to take advantage of uh, that type of effort? Do you see an opportunity there and what is that opportunity? I, if I had that, I would be uh, using this platform to, to scream it. I, <laughs> I, I think it's a necessary it's a necessary thing. I think that there are computer scientists, um, there are professionals willing to, to come in and willing to sign NDAs with different organizations, uh, willing to help um, without r sort of changing the kind of political risk that any ele election administrator or state uh, faces when opening their books, um, but at the same time getting them on a, a firmer footing. Uh, I don't know how we facilitate that sort of match.com of willing election <laughs> administrators and um, willing helpers, but if you could think of it, that would be a great benefit. I'm, uh, never mind. I, <laughs> I, I, I had a joke, and never mind, involved in an app. Uh, finally, um, I guess more of a comment, but you can respond to it, and it's in that same. I, I think uh, it's un incumbent on all of us, and, and you said this in your testimony, uh, f to look anywhere we can uh, to receive uh, expertise, help, and to be open to that. Um, you, your, your colleagues that run elections, are elections experts. You know how the process works, how it needs to work. Uh, and those security folks are security experts. And I think it's incumbent on, on the EAC uh, working with organizations to bridge that gap, to put those expertise in the same room uh, to better secure it. Because uh, as you noted, uh, when, the, when the threats are persistent uh, and sophisticated actors, uh, it's going to take a coordinated, layered uh, response uh, to be able to do that. And so I, I think I, I, I appreciate your comments about that, and I think we recognize uh, the need to do just that, to look beyond governmental uh, to private sector and other opportunities to bridge that gap and put, put folks in the same room to, to discuss the risks candidly uh, and address them. I uh, think that's right. Thanks. So with that, uh, I appreciate I appreciate you traveling out. Uh, thank your wife uh, <laughs> for us. Uh, and, uh, you know, thank you for your testimony here today. Thank you all. Next, uh, I'll call up uh, Thad Hall, Dr. Thad Hall. Uh, from Force Marsh Group. Uh, Dr. Hall 
uh, has conducted uh, research for the Federal Voting Assistance Program, the United States Election Assistance Commission, uh, the states of New Mexico and Utah, as well as local governments, including Los Angeles County, California. Uh, he's no stranger to the elections world. Uh, as the senior political scientist at Force Marsh Group, uh, his team works with organizations to evaluate, measure, understand, and influence the way people think and make decisions. Uh, he has, uh, as noted, a particular expertise in the area of election administration. Is a familiar face to all of us. And Force Marsh was the uh, contractor that the AC worked with on our um, EVES survey. And so, uh, Dr. Hall, one, thank you for being here for your work on the EVES survey and for your presentation today about the results of that survey and the plan moving forward. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start off by thanking the commissioners for inviting me here today. Uh, my name is Thad Hall, and I work at Fours Marsh Group. Um, uh, in the last year, uh, we've had a team led by my colleagues, Krisha Gagorowitz and Brian Griepentrog. Uh, who have worked with the EAC to implement the Election Administration Voting Survey, which I'll refer to as the EVES. And today I want to provide you an overview of the 2016 EVES and the findings from that um, survey. Before I go into the findings, uh, let me note that uh, the 2016 EVES began with extension, extensive outreach to all the states, Washington, D.C., and the territories to determine the issues that they've had in the past answering the EVES. Uh, from those conversations, we were able to redesign uh, the data collection process so that some of the states were able to upload all their data directly to us. We were able to change the data entry form so that they were much easier for people to use. And we, the EAC also engaged in some other activities to facilitate states providing the best data possible. Um, the EAC conducted, uh, the EAC, I'm sorry, conducted two webinars for state and localities that provided an overview of the EAC process. Um, the EAC also produced a series of videos that explained how to complete the survey. Um, there was also technical assistance uh, available throughout the process to all states and localities uh, throughout the EVES data collection. And I actually took some of the data myself from a couple of counties, um, and it was an, a very enlightening process. So the EVES has two components. There's a statutory overview survey and the actual EVES data collection. Uh, for the statutory overview, all the states and territories, with the exception of American Samoa, provided us with responses, and those uh, reports are on the EAC's website. Um, for the EVES, um, the 2016 data includes responses from all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and the territories of Guam, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Although the states are the ones who provide the data, it's important to remember that the data actually come from the local election offices. So even the states that report all the data um, directly, they're having those, much of those data input for, at the local level. And um, there were 500 and Four, five, I'm sorry, 6,467 local jurisdictions um, that provided data for the EVES. Um, and and 6,427 of them, or 99.4%, responded to the EVES. Uh, and just to give a little bit of a breakdown, since we've been talking about size of jurisdictions, um, there are two groups of states. Um, there are seven states that administer elections at the county level, I mean, sorry, at the city level municipal level, and then 43 states administer them um, by county. Um, and in the um, states that administer the elections at the municipal level, uh, 3,100 of them have fewer than 10,000 registered voters. And the median, uh, for, you know, 50 percent of them have fewer than 1,000. Um, and the median county who responds to the EVES has uh, fewer than 15,000 uh, active registered voters. So you get a sense of how small uh, most of the jurisdictions in the United States actually are. Um, about 66 percent of Americans uh, um, live in just 300 or so of the counties who respond to the EVES. Um, there were many important changes in American elections between 2012 and 2016, and I'd like to take a moment to highlight some of the key findings uh, from the 2016 EVES. First, let me focus on overall participation. From 2012 to 2016, the percentage of the citizen voting age population, so this is the percentage of the population who is 18 years or older and is a U.S. citizen, who participated in the election increased from 59% in 2012 to 63% in 2016. Uh, there were five states, Colorado, Maine, Minnesota, New Hampshire, and Oregon, uh, which reported turnout rates that exceeded 70% of their citizen voting age population. Uh, secondly, I want to discuss a couple of changes in voter registration uh, between 2012 and 2016. First, we saw a rapid growth in online voter registration. Uh, since 2012, the number of states with online voter registration increased to 35, 
and the, and the percentage of all new registrations coming from online voter registration increased from 5.3% to 17.4%. Voter registration is also changing at the polls, uh, with a 75% increase in the use of e-poll books to check in voters from 2012 to 2016. However, this growth is from a relatively small base. Approximately 82% of all local jurisdictions still use the tried and true method of um, having people check in using a paper poll book. Um, at first glance, um, these changes seem to be having payoffs. Uh, one key place where technology seems to matter is in the processing of voter, uh, voter registration forms. The EVES data shows that the increase in online voter registration was partially responsible for a 3.6% decline uh, in the number of registration forms that were rejected for either being duplicates or invalid uh, for some reason. Uh, third, let me discuss briefly how people voted in 2016. Uh, Americans continue to vote more and more prior to Election Day. Uh, approximately 41% of all ballots were cast before Election Day, uh, with 17% cast uh, using in-person uh, in early voting and 24% cast by mail. Um, of all the by mail ballots that were transmitted to absentee voters, um, and these are domestic absentee voters, 80% were returned in process and 99% of those ballots were counted. Um, on something that I know Commissioner Masterson tweeted about recently, which is actually something I am very, uh, is a statistic that is also something I care quite a bit about. The average age of a poll worker in America is not 72 years old. Um, in fact, um, only 24% of poll workers were age 75 and older, although about half of poll workers our age are over the age of 60. Uh, fourth, the biggest change um, in the 2016 election related to the participation of U.S. citizens living overseas and members of the uniformed services and their dependents. Together we refer to these voters as UACAVA voters because of the Uniformed and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act, with, which guarantees their rights. Um, the overall participation among U.S. citizens living overseas increased dramatically between 2012 and 2016. Typically, more ballots are sent to military personnel than overseas citizens, but we saw a switch um, in that statistic between 2012 and 2016. Let me close by discussing how the Election Administration and Voting Survey may change in 2018 and 2020. Uh, first, uh, we're currently working with EAC staff to determine ways that the statutory overview can be simplified and made shorter with states providing basic information regarding election administration that allows for this information to better inform the data that are found in the EVES. Um, second, the questionnaire uh, for the EVES is likely to be shorter and more precise. Over the past 18 months, the Overseas Voting Initiative, which is a cooperative agreement between the Council of State Governments and the Federal Voting Assistance Program, they worked to look at Section B of the EVES, which is the section related to UACAVA voting, and they made a sec set of recommendations about how the EVES could be improved, and we've taken those recommendations and applied them to the entire document and have gone through and looked at places where the eaves can be uh, tightened, where questions can be uh, eliminated um, when appropriate, um, but still capture the wealth of data that are necessary to serve the EAC's role as a clearinghouse. Finally, we're examining ways to use technology more effectively in the data collection processes so states and localities complete, can, com can complete the eaves faster and more accurately where we can have um, real-time uh, you know, data checking and things like this so that people will know when there are errors or when there are, are missing data. Um, finally, I'd like to just take a moment to um, say how much our team at Forest Marsh Group has enjoyed working with Sean Green here at the EAC. Uh, Sean's been a great collaborator and partner in the process, and we're grateful to been have been able to work so closely with him. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak for you today, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Commissioner Hicks. Dr. Hall, thank you for all your hard work with the, um, with the survey. Um, I have to say that in my reading of it, it looks very, it's very impressive. Uh, it's a lot different than the other surveys have been, not that they were uh, any, you know, not as good, but they, this is very impressive to me. Um, you had mentioned something in, in the numbers for um, poll workers. Yes, sir. And I'm very, um, interested in finding out, have those numbers changed over the last four years? Um, as in, are poll workers getting younger um, no, because of the great recruitment of the EAC? <laughs> <Yeah>. or so, <laughs> so let me answer um, 
that question in a hedging way since I'm not looking <laughs> at the data that I would need to answer that. But um, first, poll workers have always been younger than people said they were. Um, there's data that's, um, um, so uh, the Caltech MIT Voting Technology Project does a survey um, after each election and um, you know, when you go back to 2008, we've known since then that you know, the average poll worker was roughly in their 50s. Uh, which is actually the age people seem to like the most because it seems they seem managerial, um, you know, and appropriately adult, <laughs> but not too adult and not too young, and um, and so the EAC data, you know, mirrors that when we look at the distribution. And I don't think the distribution was that much different in 2012. Okay. But the other thing to remember is it varies widely by state and widely within states. How and that's based purely on, you know, the recruitment efforts. So I know, for instance, in looking at data from Ohio. Um, in a couple of you know past elections where we actually <laughs> had election data from the counties themselves on their poll workers, um, that it varied dramatically. In some of the counties, uh, the average age of a poll worker was in their 40s, and some it was you know closer to 55 or 60. Okay. Um, you also mentioned that there are 35 states and territories that have online voter registration yes. now, which leaves about 20 mm -hmm. um, jurisdictions in terms of states and, and uh, territories that do not have online voter registration. Right. Is there a main reason why those other those 20 states are saying that they don't want or they haven't done online voter registration? Um, that was not. You know, it's obviously it. not part of the Eve's data right. collection. I can tell you that there are. You know, several states that are moving in that direction that just didn't have it online in 2016. And so I know that by 2018, there'll be even more states that have online voter registration. And I think in, you know, in some cases, you know, the issues that we've, we've been discussing earlier about cybersecurity, I think a lot of states are wanting to just make sure that all of their systems are, are secure as they're doing this. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is also something that states are thinking about. Okay. Um, and lastly, um, there's been some talk, it's back, been back and forth in terms of, um, you had alluded a little bit to this earlier, of the data coming directly from the states to you. Right. Um, in terms of that upload, is that mm -hmm. done still through Excel, or is that more web -based? So we did it in two ways. So, um, so, in, so there are three ways that states provide us with data, basically. In one case, um, so a, a good example of this would be the state of Texas. They actually send um, an Excel template to each of the counties, and the counties then complete that Excel template and send it back. We redesigned that template so that a, a, um, a large county, um, like Travis County, could just go in and, and paste all of their Section B data, all their Section C data in <coughs> at one time. Um, so they didn't have to enter the data in question by question. They could run a query and then put it in. Uh, the, and then the state of Texas would then aggregate those up for us, and we made that easier as well because they could mm -hmm. just copy paste it out of each of the templates. Uh, the second thing that um, states could do, um, which is something that many of the states would do, is they would um, run queries and then they would be able to put it all into what we call the data aggregation template. And um, what we did there was to try to make it easier for states who could run almost all their data as queries, um, they could just paste it directly into the um, into an Excel document, um, but it, it was just them <coughs> running the query and then just pulling it in. And then finally, for a couple of states, we actually let them run the queries and then just, they sent us, they just had to run the queries in order and they could just send it to us as a flat file and then we were able to upload that on our end and uh, do the, um, all the data validation on our end. And so we're trying to move more toward uh, making that process for states like Texas even easier, looking at potentially uh, the possibility of that being done online where jurisdictions would enter in the data um, and then there would be a data set that, that the state of Texas could then go in and add to or do whatever they needed to before they submitted it. Um, and they would get real-time information on when counties had uh, completed the survey and information like that. And then, um, you know, and then states like Wisconsin who were able to just run the queries and upload the data would still be able to just send us a flat file and be done you know, with the process. And that also, you know, lets states that are in the middle who have to send out just for some of the data, you know, having an electronic format would let them have the best of both worlds. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Hall, for your testimony here. I appreciate you. all your hard work and Forrest Marsh's hard work on uh, uh, creating a great report. I think it was very helpful, and I look forward to continuing to use that data over the next couple of years until our next survey. Uh, you mentioned uh, various rates of compliance with uh, the data requests. Uh, zero from uh, 
American Samoa on up. Mm -hmm. uh, would you tend to think that the compliance is higher rather than lower? Where, where, are, the, where are the gaps that, that we need to look at? Sure. I think that, um, you know, one of the difficulties that a couple of states noted was that although the states have requirements under um, various um, federal laws, especially for um, providing data under the National Voter Registration Act and the Uniformed and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act, there are requirements that states provide data um, to the EAC for those two. Right. Um, the counties within states don't necessarily have the same responsibilities, right. and so sometimes it's a, the problem is the ability of the state, the Secretary of State's office to, um, or the state election office to get compliance. And that has been the primary problem, obvious, uh, and it's often coming from these local jurisdictions that we were referring to earlier, who are the smaller jurisdictions who have, you know, the clerk may have five other jobs or ten other jobs, and once the election is over, they're back into, you know, doing land, tr land deeds and things like that. And so that's been the biggest kind of um, problem that, um, that has arisen. So maybe we need to think of ways to increase the local compliance uh, with the states. Because I know it's the states that certify this information, right. correct? And I that's think correct. that's probably pretty difficult for them if they're not getting good responses from their, it, from their locals. It can be. And I think that you know, part of this goes back to the issue of, of incentives and you know, you know, thinking of ways that, that there are, if there are any positive incentives that um, can be given. And I think you know, one way to make it easier will be for the survey to be yeah. like in an online format. You know, one of the issues that you see when you um, when you send out the eaves is that also some of these smaller jurisdictions are also technologically challenged, and so they can't they don't have computers that will handle you know an Excel spreadsheet of recent vintage, and you know obviously that can be problematic. Sure, and I did hear some good things about the webinars and uh, okay. the assistance that your uh, that Forest Mars uh, provided to uh, election folks out there. I mean that was really helpful, I think, and. You know, I think more of those kinds of things probably would be helpful too. So, um, uh, would you say that this is the most complete data that we've ever collected? I th I think it's very it was very it was very complete survey. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Hall. Uh, quickly, just a couple of things. I know we're uh, over time, and I appreciate uh, the patience of the audience. Uh, the first is um, a, a comment uh, more than anything, and that that is. Uh, about the effort that you, your team, and, and our team here at the AC made to, to make the survey, the administration of the survey, easier. Uh, I got numerous comments <clears throat> that real progress was made uh, to make this less painful for state and local election officials. It's a lot of data. Uh, it can be hard to collect. Uh, and you all and, and Sean Green and, and his team did yeoman's work in doing that. That's not to say it wasn't painful. It was just less painful. And so the question is, uh, what additional steps can we take? Uh, I think you mentioned a little bit of, of that moving mm -hmm. online uh, mm -hmm. submissions, but what did you see in this process that you didn't know before that you thought, right. well, this will make, help make submission of the data easier? And y do you believe that, that I think our dream of a day in which states can just submit, just dump data to us, allow us to parse and, and allow them to review, is, is that attainable in the near future? Sure. So. Um you know, the one thing I think, one thing that we learned um, that was uh, very helpful um, as we're moving forward is that some of the questions that were in the survey itself uh, could be confusing. And one of the big things that we were able to do was provide, you know, people with good answers to those questions that made it a lot easier for states to answer them. And we've been able to address many of those issues by uh, going through the eaves and rewording questions or restructuring how they're asked to make them clearer and, and simpler moving forward. Um, you know, the other issue obviously is one of the, the actual technology of answering the survey, and I think uh, changing the structure of how the survey is, is answered by moving it you know, to another format will obviously uh, improve things as well. And, um, you know, I think that the, um, on the question of getting real-time data, um, this is something that varies a lot by states. And states that have, um, you know, highly developed election management systems can clearly do this. And so a state like Wisconsin, you know, they, uh, I know they were able to provide, you know, potentially provide us with Section B data, thus the data on military and overseas voters, um, you know, in a transactional format, um, which would be very helpful. Um, 
And I think that a lot of it depends on, on two things. One is uh, how centralized the state's uh, election management system is and the level of compliance they're able to get from their local election officials in, complete, in providing and completing those data. So even in states with a central you know, election management system, some jurisdictions are better than others at completing the survey. And so that, you know, obviously is the, you know, is kind of the ultimate place where the rubber hits the road is, is making sure that people are completing the data in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. You know, so for instance, uh, you can have a system where people um, provide the data, but they may, instead of entering it in on a day-by-day -day basis where you would then know, you know, how many days out was a ballot sent to a voter and then on what day did it come back? And then you can figure out, okay, well, what was the problem you know, was there a lag in, or what's the ballot transit time? Um, if people are entering in the, in the data every Friday as opposed to day by day, you kind of can see how, you know, you can run into these problems with the data. But in general, I think that for some states it will be soon, and for some states it will be when the federal government provides them with enough money to build a system that will so make it work. Never. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, on the other end, we, we talked a lot about making it easier to collect the data, right. which I, I think we made good progress mm -hmm. on and continue to focus on. Mm -hmm. But then there there was, I, I think, a focus from all here at the commission mm -hmm. on trying to make the t data tangible and useful to right. election officials. So we asked them to submit all this data, mm -hmm. uh, and we have not uh, done as good a job, I think, as we'd like right. to in following up to make the data useful mm -hmm. to election officials for right. budgeting, sure. for uh, benchmarking of right. processes. Mm -hmm. uh, what are our efforts there, sure. uh, and how are we making this da data real to sure. election officials? So one key thing that I didn't mention um, was that um, we're in the process of, of, of completing development of a data visualization tool for the EAC so that we'll be able to uh, people will be able to visualize the data and do basic comparisons of their jurisdiction with other jurisdictions. Actually, Noah was very helpful um, in a discussion we had um, with local election officials to find out the kind of comparisons that they want to be able to make. And we're, you know, working in to build in some of those comparisons uh, moving forward so that people will be able to take the 2016 data and look for jurisdictions like them and, you know, try to benchmark what they're doing. And I think that there'll be more and more of that um, moving forward. And, you know, we tried to present the data in a, you know, much more usable uh, manner this time in the reports that we provided. And um, it will be, you know, we can provide additional information to people about how to use the data um, and to the EAC. Yeah, I'd, I'd say, and I know Commissioner McCormick, uh, when she was chairwoman uh, in the data summit, mm -hmm. really pushed uh, and had a vision for this idea of sure. sister jurisdictions and the right. ability to match up data across jurisdictions to do those right. comparisons. And so I would love to sure. see us uh, pursue that and allow election officials to really measure themselves mm -hmm. to find areas uh, to improve and measure. And one of the things that were, um, I, I mentioned this in, in regards to um, the revisions to the statutory overview is to um, collect the data in a way that would be easier to find who your sister jurisdiction is. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things we want to do um, is instead of asking people kind of open-ended questions about how do you do this or that, is to ask more closed-in questions so that people can categorize themselves more clearly and that then people can find their, their similar jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, uh, the number of jurisdictions fewer than 15,000 registered voters, what, what was that percentage that you gave? Oh, do you remember? Sure. So um, half of all counties have fewer than 15,000 active registered voters, and 90% of all localities um, have fewer than 10,000. So, so there's a lot of little jurisdictions. Th what, what struck me about that is that those numbers, uh, given NOAA's previous testimony about right. securing election systems, right? right? We're talking about small county, small jurisdictions, right. uh, and, and what support can be given to them from right. an IT standpoint to help. And I should point out that, uh, so I'm taking these data for the eaves, and the state of Michigan, which has 1,516 local, local election offices, they actually report their data at the county level. So there's even more yeah. um, that are really small. Well, Dr. Hall, thank you for your work. Uh, thank you for the eaves. Thank you. Uh, and and making, uh, working with us to get sure. better. Uh, I think it's something we're con continuing constantly to improve on. Uh, and I think we made some really big improvements this time around, and we'll continue to. So thank you. Thank very you. Much. Well, it was a team effort on our part, and you know I want to I appreciate all the work my colleagues as well you know did on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I would offer uh, each commissioner a chance for closing remarks uh, before we adjourn the meeting.
I'll keep it very brief. Thank you to all our uh, participants today <coughs> at the meeting. I appreciate all your work and for taking time out of your busy schedules to come here and enlighten us. Uh, uh, as far as American Samoa, I think the entire commission needs to go out there and uh, collect the data at some point. Uh, perhaps Commissioner Hicks would like to go. But uh, anyway, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you again for all your participation and uh, uh, keeping us apprised of the issues and, and where we stand in the election community. It's very helpful for us going forward uh, in figuring out what we need to do to serve uh, the election community and voters across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McCormick. Vice Chairman Hicks. Um, this meeting was very informative, but with any meeting that we uh, have in such a short time frame, there are some things that we won't have a chance to talk about, like um, we had an excellent language summit this year as well, um, or the fact that the EU survey had more than a da uh, one million data points, um, which I find was just incredible. Um, and that um, Commissioner Masterson a few weeks ago had a um, Facebook Live event which focused in on um, access for veterans um, in their uh, ability to vote. Um, all great things that the EAC has done in the last few months uh, that we didn't have an opportunity to really talk about. Um, and I wanted to thank um, the commissioners for um, holding this meeting. Uh, but um, my last remark will go to something I think is pretty serious. Um, yesterday we lost, um, or you know, I. A, a very close friend of mine, uh, Peter Shellstock, who was my counterpart when I worked in the um, on the commission uh, worked in the uh, committee on House Administration. Um, Peter was very passionate about elections, um, and we lost him at a very young age. Um, and um, I'm very sorry t for that. Uh, one of the things that Peter and I Peter and I didn't agree on a lot of things. Um, politics, uh, other things like that. But one of the things we did agree on was online voter registration, and that was the basis of one of my questions earlier today. Um, we disagreed on how it should be done. Um, I, I viewed it more as a stick approach, and, and um, t um, states should have online voter registration, and they can figure out how to do it. Uh, Peter viewed it more in a carrot approach, um, but we did agree on that states should have online voter registration. And I'm hoping that um, the 20 states that presently don't have online voter registration uh, will, will follow the, sta the 35 jurisdictions and states that, or territories and states to actually have online voter registration. Um, it's very sad that Peter's no longer with us, um, and I'm hoping that, um, you know, his memory won't be forgotten. Um, so with that, I will turn this back over to Commissioner Masterson. Thank you, Vice Chairman Hicks. I would echo uh, thoughts and prayers uh, with Peter's family. He was someone uh, that worked diligently in the world of elections uh, and uh, was gone, or is gone, uh, too soon, so I appreciate that. I would also share... Uh, thoughts and prayers. Our general counsel, uh, Cliff Tatum, couldn't be here today because of a, a death in the family, and we're certainly thinking and praying uh, for uh, Cliff and his family. Uh, finally, uh, with my closing remarks, uh, I want to share uh, thoughts and prayers um, for the families and friends of those um, who uh, were killed in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, Heather Hare uh, and Troopers Cullen and Bates. Uh, and in doing so, I, I wanted to share a quote um, from President Reagan in 1984, uh, who reminded us uh, that we must never remain silent in the face of bigotry. We must condemn those who seek to divide us in all quarters and at all times. We must teach tolerance and denounce racism, anti-Semitism, and all ethnic or religious bigotry wherever they exist as unacceptable, unacceptable evils. We have no place for haters in America, none none whatsoever. And I would echo those sentiments and simply say that all Americans, thanks to our great democracy, have a voice. And that voice is in their vote. And there are elections across America this year, state and local elections, that Americans can go express that voice through their vote. Uh, so with that, uh, our thoughts and prayers with the, are with those families and those in, uh, affected. Um, and I would uh, accept and entertain motions to adjourn. So moved. Second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.